the second thing we can talk about is um, the covenant blessings and covenant curses. So in Deuteronomy 28, um, Moses, as he's winding down his life, uh, he goes over the good um, promises to follow God, and then he goes into what you get uh, if you don't fully um, obey God, uh, obey God exactly. And we can see how that played out in the rest of the Bible. Or, if you want, we can look at a quotation in Deuteronomy 32 that the book of Hebrews attributes to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32, but it actually isn't in the Hebrew uh, text of um, Deuteronomy 32. So we can do any of those, or we can do all of those. We can do them in any order. Uh, what would you like to do? Which one would you like to do first? Can we look at the covenant blessings and curses? Let's look at the covenant blessings and curses. Um, so this is toward the end of Moses' sermon. Uh, nearly the last thing he says, um, a long chapter, I think it's like 68 verses. The chapter is um, prefaced with this statement. So it will be when you cross the Jordan, you will set up on Mount Ebal these stones, as I'm commanding you today, and you will coat them with lime. So this is the top of Mount Ebal. Um, and there's an altar there. And evidently, God wanted uh, the Old Testament uh, placed where, uh, put it on plaster where people could go up and read it. Um, it's not there anymore, but this is the place. Uh, just below this place in the valley is Jacob's well. This is what Jacob's well looks like. Uh, it's 110 feet deep. Uh, think an 11 story building deep. That's what it looks like. Um, so here is Mount Ebal. Uh, Jacob's well is right here. Shechem, where the rape of Dinah uh, happened, uh, is there. And so God is saying, go back to that place um, and put the law up. Well, what else happens there in the Bible? Well, um, Ebal, Shechem, Gerizim is the first place where Abraham worships God in the promised land. Abraham passed through the place to the place at Shechem, to the oak of the teacher, Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Uh, Jacob goes there uh, to the city of Shechem uh, in the land of Canaan on his way. So Abraham comes from a foreign land, he goes to Shechem. Jacob comes from a foreign land, he goes to Shechem. Uh, and it's this Shechem uh, city that gives namesake to this boy, Shechem, uh, who ends up raping uh, Dinah, uh, and the whole city ends up being slaughtered by um, the Levites. This is the place uh, in modern times is called Nablus. Uh, it's called Nablus today because it's a, a muttering of the word Neapolis, new city. Um, when Dr. Um, Jones and I uh, took a group to the Holy Land, uh, we went to a lot of places. We were doing the next one, and we wanted to um, go to Nablus and to see this place. And they said, well, you can go. Um, the only thing is you're going to have to rent an armored car uh, if you go because it's so dangerous there now. So <laughs> you, can't, you can't go. There's a church there, but there's fighting, been fighting at this place for many, many, many years. What else happens there? Well, uh, it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you will set up the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. So there are these two 
mountains and you put the curses on Ebal and the blessings on Mount Gerizim. Our passage here, Deuteronomy uh, 29, uh, 4, when you cross over, set them up uh, on rocks with plaster. The ones who go on Mount Ebal, it looks to me like they're putting all the bad, quote unquote, so Reuben, um, the concubine um, uh, offspring Gad, the concubine offspring Asher, the um, fifth one of Leah, uh, Dan, who is Rachel's servants, and then uh, Naphtali, who's also Rachel servants. So all those people, all those tribes are going to get on top of Mount Ebal and do the curses. And all the good ones will do the blessing. So if you imagine there are uh, 600, what did we say, 603,000 fighting men. So imagine 300,000 on one, 300,000 on the other. If you want that to put that in perspective, think of Neyland Stadium three times over. And the people are shouting out these blessings and shouting out these curses. So the, this is the blessing. Now it will be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. So uh, if, you, uh, if you perfectly obey the law and you're in the country, God's going to take that as an opportunity to bless you. If you're in the city and you perfectly obey the law, God's going to take, you, take that as an opportunity to bless you. Well, where else is there versus city? So it's like wherever you are, God's going to bless you if you obey the law. Blessed will be the offspring of your body. So you have a baby and God says, okay, you had a baby, I'm going to bless you. You uh, are a farmer and you perfectly obey the law, God's going to bless the ground. God's going to bless the offspring of your animals that increase your herd, your flock, if you obey the law. Blessed will be your basket and your kneading bowl. So when you make food, God's going to say, ah, oh, you're making food. I'm going to take that as an opportunity to bless you. Blessed you'll be when you come in. Blessed be when you go out. So you walk through a door. You've perfectly obeyed the law. God says, I'm going to bless you. You walk out the door. You perfectly obey the law. God says, I'm going to take that as an opportunity to bless you. The Lord will cause the enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you in one way, and they will flee before you in seven ways. So the picture is this uh, army attacking, uh, massed, uh, concentrated, and when they get to you, they just start flying off in every direction because God is blessing you with victory. The Lord will command blessing the on you in your barn so when you try to save up what you've done God said I'm going to take that as an opportunity to bless you uh, in all that you put your hand to whatever you do will prosper if you obey the Lord your God he'll bless you in the land which the Lord gives you the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and you walk in his ways. So all the people of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. So if you've ever been disrespected somewhere, you go in and people just don't think that much of you. Think of the opposite of that. When you walk in the door, if you've obeyed God's law, what people will do is give you ultimate respect because they'll be afraid of who you are and your connection with God. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the offspring of your body, in the offspring of your beast, in the produce of the ground, in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give you rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You're going to have enough money 
to make a loan to a nation. Okay? So, like Greece is bankrupt. Okay? And they need billions of dollars to, to make it. They're going to come to you for a loan. And you're going to be able to loan that kind of money to not to a person, to a nation. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will only be above. You will never be underneath. If you listen to the commands of the Lord your God, which I charge you today, to observe them carefully. So it's not if you sometimes do it and if you sometimes don't. This is if you carefully do what God said. If you don't turn aside from the words which I command you today, to the right or left, to go after other gods, to serve them. So this is Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Ebal is here, Gerizim is here. But, so... All the bad ones will be on the Ebal side. All the good ones will be on the Gerasim side. But it will come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe all that his commandments and all his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the country. You, you break God's law and you're in the country, God's going to take that as an opportunity to curse you. You break God's law and you're in the city, God's going to take that as an opportunity to curse you. Curse be your basket and your kneading bowl. Rather than uh, getting pleasure from what you eat, God's going to curse that. Curse will be the offspring of your body. You have a baby that's cursed before God. Curse be the product of your ground. Curse be the increase of the herd and of your uh, young flock. Curse will be when you come in. You walk through a door, you've um, disobeyed God's law, he's going to curse you. You walk out, you've disobeyed God's law, God's going to curse you. The Lord will send curses, confusion, rebuke, and all you undertake until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make pestilence cling to you so you're going to have disease until he's consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess it. The Lord will smite you with consumption, with fever, inflammation, fiery heat, sword, blight, mildew, and they will, uh, will pursue you until you perish. And you say, well, okay, I'll pray my way out of it. You uh, disobey God's law. God says the heaven over you will be bronze. They're in the prayer in the world that's going to get through a bronze heaven. If you've broken uh, the law, you're, you're going to be left in your curse. And you say, okay, well, I'm not going to pray to God. I'm going to work my way out of it. Well, the earth underneath you will be iron. The Lord will make the rain turn into powder and dust, and heaven will come down on you until you're destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You'll go out and have a great plan of attack. But you're going to flee in seven different directions. You'll be an example of terrors to all kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses will be food to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. And there will be none to frighten them away as Abraham frightened away the birds from the carcasses when he did the covenant ceremony with God. The Lord will smite you with boils and tumors and scab and itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will smite you with madness, with blindness, with bewilderment of heart. You'll grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in the darkness. In, in the midday, you'll be in the pitch black of night. You'll only be oppressed. You'll only be robbed continually. They'll rob everything that you've got. Take the very clothes off your back and there'll be none to save you. You will betroth a wife and you're just waiting to consummate your love together. And this is what's going to happen. Another man will violate her. You'll build a house 
but you're not going to live in it. You'll plant a vineyard, but you'll not use his fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes. You will not eat of it. Your donkey will be torn away from you. You will not be restored to you. Your sheep will be given to your enemies, and you will have none to save you. Your sons and your daughters will be given to other people, while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually, but there will be nothing you can do. The people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors, and you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. You'll be driven mad by what you see. You'll cry out in dereliction to God. The Lord will strike you on the knees and the legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed, from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you will serve other gods of wood and stone. You will become a horror, a proverb, a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. You will bring out much seed to the field, but it will gather in little, for the locusts will consume it. You will plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes for the worm will devour them you sh shall have olive trees throughout your territory but you will not anoint yourself with oil for your olives will drop off you'll have sons and daughters but they will not be yours for they will go into captivity the cricket will possess all your trees and the produce of the ground the alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher and you will go down lower and lower. He will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He will be the head, and you will be the tail. So all these curses shall come upon and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve the enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in the lack of all things. And he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring the nation against you from afar and the end of the earth as the eagle swoops down a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance will have no respect for the old nor show favor to the young moreover it shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of the ground until you're destroyed who also leaves you no ground new wine or oil nor the increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish it shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land and it shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And then you shall eat the offspring of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you. The man who is refined and very delicate among you will be hostile to his own brother and toward the wife he cherishes and toward the rest of the children who remain so that he will not give even one of them any flesh of his children, which he will eat since he has nothing else left during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will repress you in your towns. And the refined and delicate woman among you who would never venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground for the delicateness and the refinement, she will be hostile toward the husband she cherishes and toward her son and daughter and toward her afterbirth, which issues from between her legs, and toward her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of anything else during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you in your towns. If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues, 
and miserable and chronic sicknesses. He will bring you back on you all the diseases of Egypt, which you are afraid, and they will cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. Then you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, because you did not obey the Lord your God. It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiplied you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you from among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other end of earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations you will find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. And so your life will hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day, and have no assurance. In the morning you will say, would that it were evening. And at evening you would say, would that it were morning, because of the dread of your heart which you dread for the sight of your eyes which you see. The Lord will bring you back to Egypt in ships by the way which I spoke you. You will never again see it. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. So that's a pretty rough section, isn't it? So Jackson... Tell me what you make of that. There are over three times as many curses as blessings. There are over three times as many curses as blessings. Um, and I, I could be wrong on this, but it seems like, um, especially in the blessings, there is a lot of Genesis 1 and 2 language. Absolutely. Like if, you, if you obey, you know, you stay in the land, I'm going to bless not only you, but your offspring after you. And the work of your hands, like uh, all of the labors. Um, and so it, it seems like um, there's like a reduplication there of like Adam's covenant of works in this. That's absolutely right. This is a, re some people call that a republication, but it's, it's basically giving the people the same opportunity that God gave Adam. And the requirement is perfect obedience. Should the covenant blessings be enough to lure us into perfectly obeying the law? Yeah. So the law is going to ask us, or are the horrors of the covenant curses enough to drive us away from disobeying the law? So what's your question? Why do we do it anyway? Why do we do it anyway? I mean, could God have added any more blessing? Could he have threatened more than he threatens? Let me ask a different question. I mean, Jackson, I'll ask you this. Um, did anyone ever do enough to get the covenant blessings? Jesus. He perfectly obeyed the law. He came to basically the Adamic covenant in the Mosaic law. Did he love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength? Mm -hmm. Did he love his neighbor the same exact way that he loved himself? Mm -hmm. Did Jesus get the covenant blessings in life? He died, and how did he die? Shamefully. All the curses upon him. He died. Did you pick? I was trying to slip in little parts of the crucifixion when I read it. Did you pick it up? His clothes were robbed. He died of thirst. It was dark in the middle of the day. He was besieged. 
the thing uh, that he saw was driving him mad, right? The, the whole cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, having earned the covenant blessings, what he got in life was the covenant curses. And that's where this becomes so beautiful. Because this uh, ceremony was to happen right there. This is where uh, Abraham first worshipped in the promised land. This is where Jacob worshipped. This is where uh, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, this is the first place in the land that they're uh, worshipping with this ceremony. They put all the bad ones up on the uh, Mount of Curse. They put all the good ones on Mount Gerizim. And did anything else in the Bible happen at this place? Jacob's well. Yeah. Yes. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Is she a law keeper or a law breaker? She's a law breaker. And what should law breakers get? Curses. Curses. How many curses? Is one of the curses lawbreakers get thirst? Is this woman thirsty? And what does Jesus promise her at this place? Ask of me and I will give you living water. How in the world can Jesus at this place promise a sinful, guilty, law-breaking woman the covenant blessings. How can he do that? Because he, he earned it. He has a right to the covenant blessings. Well, somebody's got to pay for the curses, and what's Jesus going to say? I paid for the curses. The two will be one flesh. Whatever she does, he does. But whatever he does, she does. Jesus is able to come to this place and able to um, give a sinful, law-breaking woman covenant blessings because he's willing to take for the covenant curses. He fully obeyed the law. He's the way that this woman can find blessings. This is the church that's built over the top. And this is the actual well. And that's the actual water, or continuous uh, water that the woman was going to draw. Do you see how the purpose of the Pentateuch is to drive us from ourselves? To drive us from this idea, well, I'll just fulfill the law. Well, it isn't if you try to fulfill the law. It's if you perfectly obey the law. If you're careful to do according to all that's written in it. I don't know about you, but I'm not careful to do all that's written in it. I ha haven't been in the past. I'm not today. I know uh, it's unlikely I am going to be in the future if it depends on me, because I know in my flesh dwells no good thing. In Jesus' flesh dwells every good thing. In Jesus' flesh dwells perfect love for the Lord his God. In Jesus' flesh dwells perfect love. And so I can either try to fulfill the law on my own, or I can run in helpless desperation like this woman and have Jesus give it to me. I think that's what the blessings and curses are about. And everybody in the Old Testament, they hear the law and they always say the same thing. All that the Lord said we will do. Everybody says that. And nobody does. 
Jesus can say, all that the Lord has said I did, he fulfilled the requirements of the law, and therefore he can grant that righteous status to all those who come to him by faith. That's what I think this is about. And I think that's uh, the purpose of the covenant blessings and the covenant curses. I think this is near the place where that well is. I, I've never actually been to the place. They won't let you go these days, but evidently that's outside the church and that's inside the church but there's so much fighting that uh, at least when this picture was taken they weren't able to um, finish the church all right so we looked at the covenant blessings and curses what else do you want to look at Right, so in Hebrews 1, there's a quote from Deuteronomy 32. It's right here. Again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And if we hover over that, it says Deuteronomy 32.43. So would someone read Deuteronomy 32, 43? Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate them and cleanses his people's land. So the writer of Hebrews says that the scripture says, let all the angels of God worship him. Um... At least this resource is saying that comes from Deuteronomy 32, uh, 43. But when we look at Deuteronomy 32, 43, it doesn't say those words. So is that a little scary to you? Um, it's terrifying to me. Um, uh, because, um, I mean, I've committed my life uh, to supporting um, the inerrancy of God's word. Um, Hebrews 1 is quoting a text. Uh, scholars are directing me to Deuteronomy 32.43, and yet when I go to Deuteronomy 32.43, and look at the Hebrew text, that's not what the Hebrew text says. The writer of Hebrews is quoting a section that's not in the Hebrew Bible that I have. That used to terrify me. It actually makes me very, very, very happy today. Happy... Uh, for have had the leisure to look at this question happy uh, for you because I believe your trust in God's word is going to radically grow up or go up uh, because of what we're going to look at. So the text is Deuteronomy 32. 43, 32, 43. Writer of Hebrews says, 
Let all the angels of God worship him. The Hebrew text uh, looks like this in the printed form. Uh, it says something like, uh, shout with joy, a goyim, uh, with him or with his people, because the blood of his servants he avenged. Um, he, vengeance will uh, rise on his enemies. He covers his ground with his people or something like that. That's what the printed text says. And we actually live in a day where we can actually look at the actual manuscript and we look at this manuscript and that's exactly what it says. What I read, so the, it's not what the writer of Hebrews wrote. Now, for years, um, when I came to something like this and found a place where the text reads differently uh, from what the New Testament reads, I was confused and I didn't know what to do. And finally, after years, someone pointed out to me, I think God um, pointed it out through people, but someone pointed out that this manuscript is This is called BHS, Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. It's the printed Bible that all printed Bibles come from. And it's manuscript B19A in the uh, State Library in Leningrad, which is called St. Petersburg today. So, this manuscript, uh, the one that I ha had on the screen, is manuscript B19A, the Leningrad Codex, and that codex um, was copied in 1008. AD. Help me with that. Is that an ancient manuscript or a medieval manuscript or a modern manuscript? It's a comparatively recent manuscript. You probably have a question. Your question is, this, is this the oldest manuscript that we have? And it's not. We have lots of older manuscripts. Uh, one of the older manuscripts is called the Aleppo Codex. Uh, the Aleppo Codex is copied in 930 AD. Uh, a few years back, I was studying Psalm uh, 22, Psalm 22 has a textual variant. Uh, I wanted to know what the Aleppo Codex uh, said. I happened to be in Jerusalem. I was in the shrine of the book. I walked up to a, a display there. I looked down at the book and lo and behold, it's the Aleppo Codex. It was under glass, but I couldn't believe it. I bent over and looked at the Aleppo Codex and I think the Aleppo Codex was open to Psalm 35. So it's like three pages away from, I wanted to see what its reading was in Psalm 22. The Aleppo Codex, however, has been subject to theft and somebody ripped Psalm 22 out of the Aleppo Codex. I knew that, uh, but even just being in the presence of the Aleppo Codex just made my heart race knowing that a page had been there and it was 70 years older than uh, Leningrad Codex. Um, we have a, 
the Cairo Geniza fragments that date from about 650 AD. Uh, it's a synagogue in Cairo. They had a bunch of old manuscripts. They were in a closet, got bricked up, left there for 100 years. Uh, finally, somebody found them. There are all kinds of biblical manuscripts. So those are older. Um, we have translations of the text in uh, Greek, in Latin, in Aramaic, uh, in Syriac. And we can go to all those, but I imagine that you have a question about this reading. Do any of the rest of them have it? And the answer to that's going to be, what do you think, yes or no? Uh, they do. In fact, we've got a reading from the Dead Sea Scrolls the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are 1,200 years older than B19A. And guess what's going to be true of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the New Testament? Just take a wild stab in the dark. Or let me put it this way. If you are a Jewish copyist and the last words out of um, God, Moses' mouth was God telling him about let all the angels of God worship a second figure. Let all the angels of God. Would that be tempting to you to try to fix by slightly changing a letter? I don't know. It depends on how honest you are, right? Uh, if you have a wicked flesh like mine, uh, you might be tempted to try to change some letters. And you might be thinking, I can get away with it because we burn the manuscripts once we copy it. And uh, after we burn the manuscripts and uh, I copy it, the only evidence that's left is my copied manuscript. And so I'll just change it around just a little bit. And you know what? The guy almost got away with it. But in 1947, there was a little shepherd boy who had lost his sheep. And he didn't want his father to beat him. So he looked for the sheep everywhere. And he happened to go to Qumran. And there was a cave on a cliff. And had a hole in the wall. And he didn't want to climb all the way down. So he thought, I'll throw rocks in the cave entrance. And if there's something in there, the sheep will uh, bleat. And... So he starts throwing rocks in this little bitty hole and, and, and God gave him extraordinary aim and one of those rocks just went right through the hole and then when it hit like thousand dishes broke it sounded like and the guy thought well my dad may be mad about the sheep but if I can find some kind of ancient uh, text uh, Maybe he's not going to be so mad. And so he climbed down in that cave, and guess what he found? He found the first cave of the Dead Sea Scrolls that over and over and over again has sided with the New Testament against the Masoretic text in places that are Christologically significant. Uh, we're going to see when we look at uh, Psalm 22 uh, the Masoretic text reads, they surrounded my hands and feet like a lion. And that's what's printed in all the Hebrew Bibles. You know what the Dead Sea Scrolls read? The Dead Sea Scrolls read, they pierced my hands and feet. Dead Sea Scrolls were written before Jesus died on the cross. You tell me which one of those readings. The Dead Sea Scrolls weren't copied by Christians. They are copied by Jews. Uh, the problems that you have with stuff like Deuteronomy 32 not being in the Masoretic text initially will terrify you because you say I've given my life to the Bible being true and, 
And maybe it's not true, but I can tell you this, 31 years into biblical studies, um, I still have some questions. There's some, still some things that trip me up. Over and over again, the burning questions that I had were questions answered by a diligent study. And I think this one, uh, it's true that uh, it doesn't agree with B19A. Uh, it does agree with the reading in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it shows that somebody was bothered enough by the reading, let all the angels of God worship him, that he tried to fix it. And he tried to fix it by changing some letters around. And he would have gotten away with it, but God had evidence there. And we can look at that evidence. Wouldn't the New Testament also have closer, you know, like it would have a lot closer. Uh, it's a thousand years closer than B19A. Yeah, so it's like the, the copies of the New Testament we would have actually would almost validate the Old Testament. From your mouth to God's ear. Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday.